My name is Eric Ellis. I'm the Eastern Great Lakes Regional Wildlife Biologist for the Rough Grouse Society and the American Woodcock Society. And I'm here with Tim Riley from? I'm with the Wildlife Division of the Michigan Department of Natural Resources. And we're at a uh, Michigan Drummer Fund project site uh, near Frederick, Michigan. And we're going to discuss a little bit about what the project involved and uh, how it's benefiting uh, young forest habitat and upland hunters. Uh, so first thing we've got right here, well, may, Tim, maybe you could describe uh, what the, um, from your end, what the grant process was and how we came to getting this project together. Um, on our end, the Drummer Fund's a really cool deal. Um, it's super simple. It's basically a one, um, a one page form you fill out, uh, outlining your project and what, what the goals of the project are and a timeline. Um, and it allows us to get uh, the funding to do projects like this. Uh, this particular project was to get mass producing trees in places that were lacking on the edge of grouse and woodcock cover. Um, and we also opened up some of these uh, historic openings with the use of the RGS machine. And from our end, we, we put out an application, uh, usually in November. Uh, the applications are due in December and uh, we review them in January and we have a, a state committee. It's made up of members of chapters Every chapter can send a representative uh, to uh, our annual meeting, and we rank projects, score them, and then distribute the funds to them. And, and the funds come from our, our banquets. A portion of all the proceeds from banquets go into the state drummer funds. Um, and other funds come from uh, private donations and then also from chapter donations. So we have... Uh, uh, we get funds from a variety of places and, and it's, the only, it's the only dedicated source of money for young forest habitat in almost every state that, it, that, that we have uh, the program going. And this past year, I believe we, in Michigan, we distributed $44,000 to, I believe, about 10 projects. And so you can, if you want to pan around here, you can see we've, we did some native uh, plantings that we've protected from the deer. Uh, all, a lot of the all the plantings were adjacent to existing young stands that will be managed for aspen and for young forest and uh, for the foreseeable future. Uh, you can see some of the the stumps and and that from where we we expanded the wild wildlife openings and that you see a lot of brambles and things that are coming up. You know that'll be great bugging uh, bugging habitat for for chicks in the spring and and this is this is benefiting not just grouse and woodcock but a whole variety of wildlife. You know, this is anything you do for grouse and woodcock is good for deer, and and it's not it's not that's the opposite isn't true. But uh, if you're improving grouse and woodcock habitat, you're improving deer habitat and songbird habitat for a number of species. Especially with the drummer fund, when we raise money at the banquet, that money's getting put into the drummer fund and getting put to projects on the ground. Just like the, I mean, you can come out and see it, feel it. You know, there's a lot of people that get a lot of enjoyment out of those funds that we raise. A site like this is, I would assume, is 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 going to be managed for young forest habitat uh, for decades, really. Yeah. Um, you start putting in the, the effort to improve it for that, then it usually stays that way, and and that's what a lot of people in the state want. They they want better wildlife habitat, and uh, uh, you know you, you, they want sustainable forest management, and and this is this is a great way to do it. I'm Al Stewart, the Upland Game Bird Specialist with the Michigan Department of Natural Resources. And I'm Eric Ellis, the Eastern Great Lakes Regional Wildlife Biologist for the Rough Grouse Society and, and American Woodcock Society. The Michigan Department of Natural Resources has a great working relationship with the Rough Grouse Society and American Woodcock Society because Michigan's really a leader in uh, management for rough grouse and woodcock. So it's, a, it's an excellent opportunity to work together, to partner. We have a memorandum of understanding that's been uh, signed by both parties, and we're out doing work on the ground. Well, in Michigan, we're, we're focused on maintaining aspen habitat and supporting uh, the, the timber in industry to keep that habitat being created uh, and to focus on making sure there's enough young forest, early successional habitat out there for, for grouse and woodcock, um, and then also uh, protecting the, the rights of you know, hunters in the state and access issues uh, uh, so people can, 
can get to that habitat and and enjoy those traditions they've they've had uh, for many years. You know, our, our main priorities is to keep uh, young forests on the landscape, you know, and to maintain aspen at various levels of, you know, age classes. And, and then we work really closely with um, the Forest Management Division of, of uh, the Department of Natural Resources, and it's through that partnership with the Rough Grouse Society and the timber industry that we're able to create the habitat that we, we do um, for grouse and woodcock. And we're able to do that so we have economic incentives and where we can also tie in the communities to this uh, as well for the tourism side of it or, you know, again, to, to get the product out of the forest and into people's hands. So, so in Michigan, we have what we call the GEMS program, and it's a grouse enhanced management sites. They're distributed throughout the state, the Upper Peninsula, the Northern Lower. And it's, a, it's an area where we're intensively managing aspen or young forest for grouse and woodcock. And it's a place where it's a sort of a walking trail that, you know, skid trail that meanders through it. And people of almost any age can utilize these sites. So you have a place where you can take a, a, a youngster that maybe isn't quite up to carrying a gun yet, but wants to be out in the woods. You can take them along with you hunting. If you, I have some friends that, that uh, you know, their knees are going bad, they're getting up in age, but, they're, but their love, um, their quality of life is based on hunting grouse and woodcock, running their dog. And uh, so this, these gem sites allow you a place to do that, run your dog on the side into the woods, and uh, you can negotiate along the trail much easier than you can try to climb through a clear cut or something. Mm -hmm. And it gets everybody engaged in the outdoors and in hunting. And uh, you know, it, it's like I said, it's really a quality of life issue. And I, I hope you know these places are certainly available to me and my kids into the future. Yeah, and we're partnering with the development of these uh, these sites. Uh, we're helping with funding, habitat improvement projects. Uh, I think it's worth noting that uh, access to these sites for vehicles uh, is, is blocked off in most areas. So people that uh, want to run their dogs in a place where there's, there's, there aren't going to be uh, four-wheelers or, or trucks or you know, vehicles around will have that opportunity. Um, and I think one thing that's kind of, well, there's another, there's two other things. One, it's, there's a combination uh, with these gem sites with the local uh, chambers of commerce and local businesses that if you go to one you can take a picture of yourself at at the, the main gate uh, you show that picture at one of the cooperators they'll give you a discount on something um, and another thing that I think is really important about these sites is it, it demonstrates that managing for grouse and woodcock it benefits all kinds of other species you know if people are good at birders deer hunters or good turkey hunters they're gonna catch on to these sites that this type of management really helps the species that they're most interested in as well. Uh, so I think that'll help not uh, spread sort of that type of management around a little bit more as there are more people that, that see the value in it. I really love hunting woodcock and grouse because of the dog work. I have English setters, raise English setters, and it's, it's the enjoyment of seeing the dogs, you know, move and flow through the woods, you know, and then catching scent and then, and then pointing the birds and then, and then trying to negotiate your your position in there enough where you can at least see the bird flush up ahead of them. And, and then taking friends, people who have never been out before, right. to, just to see the spectacular side of what goes on to it. It's a different type of hunting, you know, it's, it's, it's challenging, um, but there's a lot of things that are, that are actually a little bit easier, especially if you're a deer hunter. You, you don't necessarily have to get up at four in the morning, you don't have to worry about what you smell like unless your hunting partners are, are really giving you grief. Um, <laughs> you don't have to worry about wind direction too much, I mean a little bit, but uh, it's, it's something you can, uh, you know, in October, uh, September, it's, it, the woods are just as, you know, there's different smells and it's beautiful, you know, the changing leaves and the whole part of it, working with the dogs, being out with friends is, is really enjoyable and, and uh, it's a tradition in Michigan for, uh, I mean, as long as, it goes as far back as people have been hunting with, with dogs and even before that mm -hmm. here in the state, obviously. Yeah. So.
and, it, the, and it's, it's not just the hunting of the, 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 the birds in the fall, but it's, it's also that, the, the side of in the spring when you can go out into the woods and if you're trout fishing, you know, you can hear the birds drumming along the edge of the stream. Or you go out in the evening um, and, and you can hear the woodcock, you know, singing in their display and, right. and up into the, you know, into the air, which is really spectacular and unlike any other, you know, bird species that you get to look at. And you can take individuals out and show them that. Right. And really share with them the tradition of the outdoors and getting people engaged in the outdoors. And, and those same habitats too also support a lot of bird, songbird species that are very interesting to, you know, for, for birders and just people who are interested in different types of, of bird life. Um, and it can be real challenging to find them because they're there because the cover's thick and it helps protect them from predators. Uh, but if you get in and, you know, a little golden wing warbler is pretty tiny, but if you can get in and find them and get a picture of one, it's, it's a real achievement and it's really uh, it's something that's fun to do. So sometimes with the young forest habitats, we tend to overlook the other suite, the other group of birds that use those. And Eric had an opportunity to take some uh, birders out uh, to one of the areas where we've done habitat work. And what did you find up there? We found 46 different species of birds in about an hour and the um, the birder who led the trip who's one of the most experienced ones in northern Michigan said it was top three birding site in northern Michigan. Uh, it was you because there's some older growth but then there's really young growth kind of medium age growth there uh, it's very intensively managed for grouse and woodcock and the other birds are there too so it's uh it was really something to see. And during migration, those young forests are something that migrating birds key in on. Uh, so this time of year would be another a good time to go out there again, maybe pick up a few more species. You know, when, we're, when we talk about the, the cooperation and the partnerships, we've been fortunate within the Michigan DNR to have wildlife habitat grants. And you, you, you'll be able to look at that habitat and some of the work that's been done. But we, we use some of the sportsmen's dollars from their licenses, hunting licenses, to help underwrite this grant. And then individuals like Eric through the Rough Grouse Society apply for it and say, here are the things that we can do to help wildlife, and particularly rough grouse and woodcock, you know, into the future. And so this partnership takes those dollars and matches them up with on the ground work. And, and, and also, you know, continues to bring in all these other partners to get this work done and that that carries a lot of strength and and where, where people feel they're part of it and really can make a huge difference yeah. Hi, i'm fritz heller uh from northwest lower peninsula of michigan and uh here with the uh, 2015 grouse camp tour with Matt Solberg of the Rough Grouse Society. I've been grouse hunting since uh, about 1999. I've been doing it very seriously since uh, probably 2003 when I moved up north. Um, when my wife and I got married, we moved up north to start our careers. Um, prior to that, I was primarily a southern Michigan pheasant hunter and uh, you get frustrated with the private land aspects of pheasant hunting and, and uh, the agriculture economics that go into that. And uh, I kind of saw the future that grouse hunting and public lands, uh, if you want to be a bird hunter in the state of Michigan, that's, that's what you needed to do. And I uh, wanted to move up north for a variety of reasons. One, the, the fishing and two, the hunting and, and the access to public lands. My dad was a pheasant hunter growing up and so he took us pheasant hunting and uh, the, the, uh, the fascination of grouse hunting started when we were steelhead fishing and uh, we would see birds along the banks and everything and uh, it, it was just this function of that I was a bird hunter and grouse were what was available and then when you, when you begin to hunt grouse you understand why they're so dynamic of a bird and such a challenge to hunt. Um, the places you find them, the variety of covers, where you can find them, the puzzle trying to figure it all out is so different than any other kind of bird hunting I've ever done. Uh, this is Bella. She's uh, 10 years old. Uh, she was born in 2005. Um, she, uh, 
she saw some uh, pretty good glory days. She's starting to slow down a little bit, but she's, uh, she's the mom to the two dogs I've got in the truck behind me. And uh, she's seen a lot of grouse over her years. She's a uh, Labrador Retriever, uh, about 50 pounds, and uh, has had a wonderful career, still going strong at uh, 10 years old. We grew up with Labradors, so it was just a natural fit that when we got out of college and you got your own place, or in Rick's case, he kind of went a little early um, and found a place in college to live where he could have a dog. But we, um, so that was a natural fit. And when I moved up north, my first grouse season, I was very frustrated in the sense that I didn't exactly have all the answers yet, but I was very driven to find them out. And for a while, I thought, I need to get a pointing dog. These are birds that have to be hunted over a pointing dog or they're gonna be most effective. And I was very fortunate that a lot, of, a lot of people through our local Rough Grouse Society chapter were willing to mentor me and take me hunting and I hunted over a lot of different breeds. And at the end of the day, the flush rates weren't any different than my flush rates uh, over Labradors. And the pace of the hunt is, is uh, intense and fast and that fits my personality and uh, they're hard charging flushing dogs and uh, they just fit all aspects of my lifestyle from, from being at home with my kids now to the way I like to hunt and then also the number one thing I love about my labs and I don't mean any offense to anybody else's bird dogs um, and I hunt over a lot of great grouse dogs of all different breeds but our dogs are just dynamic dead bird hunters, cripple finders and retrievers. Our grouse camp is, uh, I think this will be our 13th year, maybe our 12th. And our grouse camp started uh, as a result of all our buddies from high school and college that we hunted and fished together all the time. Before we had careers, before we had wives, before we had families, grouse camp has evolved into that one week a year where we're all together in the same place at the same time. And that is what is most important about grouse camp. Some years we shoot bushel baskets full of birds, some years we shoot two birds. So grouse camp has evolved over the years. I'm fortunate that my parents bought a cabin on a trout stream in northern Michigan in uh, 2003 and we started our grouse camp that year and uh, it's evolved into this day. I think this will be our 13th year coming up. Typically it would be going on this weekend but we have a buddy, his wife has a big birthday, so we had to postpone it. But uh, the really the greatest aspect about our grouse hunt is it's all the people we used to spend time with on a day-to-day -day basis hunting and fishing when we were young. Now that we all have careers, we all have families, we all have wives, we all have commitments. We're all in the same place at the same time for three, four, five nights a year. It's all planned, everybody knows about it, scheduled. That's what's so dynamic about it tell old stories, dream about the future, celebrate dogs that we've had, celebrate dogs that we're gonna have, swap stories, go hunting, go fishing. Uh, that's, what, that's what's the amazing part of grouse camp. So the biggest misconception in the sport of hunting in general, or the sport of, of grouse hunting, is that it's all about the kill. And really the kill is the last part of the equation. The minute you pull the trigger and that grouse falls out of the sky, that hunts over. It's really about the journey to that point, the puzzle pieces, everything you can put together to get there. The kill's important. Um, everyone likes to have satisfaction, including myself, but the deeper satisfaction is the journey to that point and getting there. Your evolution as a hunter, your evolution of your dogs, all of that is really what we're out here for. We're all gonna eat tonight. I'm not worried about that. So it's getting there. You've got high years where you kill more birds and you got low years where you kill less birds, but you're still out there hunting for those experiences and that journey. When uh, we were little, we, um, we were taught from day one that if you're going to, um, if you're gonna take from a resource, you need to give back. And so my dad always took us kids to different conservation banquets in southern Michigan all the time. And uh, so that was instilled for me from the beginning. The other thing is, is 
I was given an opportunity by mentors. I got involved at uh, our local chapter through a gentleman I met at the gun club and he was kind enough to invite me onto the board. Uh, I took over a couple of events and then they were kind enough to nominate me to be president of our chapter. And it's twofold. It's the relationships I've built through the Rough Grouse Society and it's also the fact that I'm working towards what I think will be my children's opportunity, other children's opportunity to enjoy a sport that's meant so much to me and to get out of that sport everything it's provided to me in my life. And grouse hunting brings a lot of mental healing to my life and I assume to a lot of grouse hunters' lives. It's comforting to know there's habitat and there's birds, there's places you can share with your friends and your buddies and the work the Rough Grouse Society does is dynamic, especially at the influence level. And what I mean by that is the work they do to uh, help the Forest Service, help states, help counties manage public forests in a proper way, to converse with politicians, to make sure that people understand how important proper forest management is on the macro level for the economy of these states, for a renewable resource, and then on the micro level for, for users. The Rough Grouse Society represents a user group that needs forest that's managed. And so um, it all comes together. I guess if I could tell you, it's for planning for the future for my kids so they can have out of hunting, what I've gotten out of it, what I, the experiences I've shared with my family and my friends, it's the community involvement aspect of it, the social aspect of it. And uh, it's an amazing organization. You'll meet amazing like-minded people. And we're working towards a common goal. And uh, the first thing I do is invite them to one of our chapter meetings. And I say, just come sit in. Get to know the guys. We're not asking you to, to do anything more than come to the meetings. If you feel comfortable offering your opinion, your two cents, great. If that's in two months, fine. If it's in a year, fine. If it's in two years, fine. But we need people at the chapter level. And so when somebody shows interest in coming to uh, and being part of the Rough Grouse Society above the member level, so being an active volunteer, the first thing I ask them to do is start attending our chapter meetings. Hopefully that leads to them attending our chapter events, our, our sporting clay shoots, our dog trials, our, uh, our, the different, all the variety of events that we have going on throughout the state of Michigan and gets them hooked and then they use their connections, their different uh, networks, their friends, and they help grow the organization that way. So we ask uh, new committee members, we, we give them one goal for the year and that's to bring a table to our banquet. Show up at the meetings, give us input if you'd like, we'd love to have you become friends with everybody, and bring a table of new people to our banquet. Let's get them hooked and go forward. That's how we grow. Well, this is uh, an alder cutting. Yeah, we're in northern Michigan. And what we've done here is taken strips, 70-foot wide strips, uh, where we, we cut, clear cut through, mostly clear cut through. We've left some standing trees, some some paper birch, uh, some cedar trees mixed in. Um, but this site right here we cut in this year. So this is one summer's worth of growth. You'll see a lot of the, the forbs or herbaceous stuff is coming in. But the alder, that's what all these little pockets are. That's, that's all alder that's, that's coming back really well. Um, so we used our habitat equipment to uh, come through and clear this. You can actually see some of our flagging that's still left marked it uh, last winter. Immediately adjacent to this is the, a site where we did the same thing just five years ago. So you can see the amount of growth from, from this to five years later. The stem density is really picking up. We still have a fair amount of, of grass and, and uh, forbs down low, um, but you're starting to get some, you know, a little more structure in the, in the stand, and that's when a lot of birds will start you know going in there and utilizing it and then just past that is it it's a little bit you know it's maybe five six feet taller on average uh, is a stand that we cut ten years ago and we'll move down there and take a look at it but that's a site where the grasses and things in the understory are starting to get shaded out 
and the understory is starting to open up while there's still a, a canopy of lots of st you know, high stem density canopy. And that's where you start getting hit in the sweet spot for woodcock because they don't have the grasses to maneuver through. It's a little more open for them maneuvering, but the stem density is high enough above them that it protects them from predators. Uh, these are all moist soils, so they have, um, you know, they can get invertebrates and earthworms. And very close to here, we've, we have large open fields that are maintained as fields where they can roost at night. So you'll get a lot of woodcock and grouse in here and songbirds as well. Um, that will utilize this young forest habitat. Some of them will move next door, you know, right next to us to the older habitat. Uh, but it all starts, it all starts like this. And right after the cut, it just looks like a field of shredded up trees and shrubs, but you can start to see the growth already. And, and different songbirds especially will use this right now. They, they prefer that open area, whether it's like a kingbird that sits on a perch and chases after flying insects. Uh, they can't really do that where it's really thick with a lot of stems, so they need a little open area for like, or to do that. Um, and other birds, that shrubby habitat right there is, is getting to be about you know perfect size for golden wing warblers that nest near or on the ground, uh, or chestnut sided that will warblers that will also nest in that. And uh, you know that's ephemeral habitat. We have to keep creating it. Um, Otherwise, if you just let everything grow up, where are those birds going to nest? Uh, where are the woodcock going to go? Where are the grouse going to go? Um, so that's sort of the overview of what we're doing here. We have a number of places where we're putting in these strips. It's a 20-year cycle. So five years from now, we'll go through and we'll cut this strip over here. And that's when you can see there's more taller trees taking over. And uh, it's still nice, thick cover. Um, but if, if nothing is done to manage it, it'll eventually turn into a, a stand with just mostly overstory trees. And uh, we, we, we want that type of habitat too, but we have plenty of it here. So we're gonna cut another 70 foot strip. So then this whole section right here will be in multiple, multiple age classes of young forest. Again, my name is Eric Ellis. I'm the Eastern Great Lakes Regional Wildlife Biologist and Grant Writer uh, for RGS and AWS. And tonight I want to talk about our Drummer Fund program. Uh, it's, it's, this year is the fifth year that we've had the Drummer Fund running. And I want to give you some highlights of what we've done with it uh, and some of the projects that, that we've been able to accomplish with our partners. The Drummer Fund is focused on young forest habitat, and as many of you know, it's, it's you know, grouse and the woodcock are the, the main show for you know, most of us in this room, but there are dozens and dozens of other species that use this habitat that require it at some point in their, in their uh, life cycles. And it's, this is, it's not just birds, it's mammals, uh, it's reptiles, it's amphibians, There's, it's, it's the whole, it's, if somebody says, oh, you just like that habitat because you go shoot woodcock in there, it's not just that. There's a lot of other species that use this habitat. 